We believe at Parish that it's out of worship of the triune God that flows all of Parish life here in our lives corporately as a body of believers, but also individually as our families. We're so grateful for the Lord's Day. And we come with this gospel invitation from Philippians chapter 4. Paul says, God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. With that hope, let's stand and sing. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let, Let the, the redeemed, redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and, and gathered in from, from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. <laughs>
Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things, and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant, who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
the word of the Lord as it comes from Exodus 20, beginning at verse 1. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. through our study in the Ten Commandments, we come to the end of the second table of the law. The second table focused primarily on love for our neighbor. We come to the Tenth Commandment, to love our neighbor with the desires of our hearts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on our time in his word. Our Father, we thank you for your word that reveals to us who you are in your holy character and nature. Oh Lord, would you come this morning and, and satisfy the desires of our hearts with yourself. Lead us into all truth by your spirit of truth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In his sermon... The weight of glory, C.S. Lewis, deals with the desires of our hearts as he says this. If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. He says, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. He says, we are far too easily pleased. Maybe you come this morning and you say, well, Brian, I have strong desires for a lot of different things. And maybe it's that vacation trip that your neighbor got to go on, but y'all stayed at home. And maybe it's the house beyond the fence. And maybe it's you fill in the blank. All that you spend your time on, all that you spend your energy after and your effort think that, that will satisfy. What Lewis is doing is putting his finger on the nerve of our desires in the heart. And he says, you're trying to fill up your heart with every other thing, every lesser thing than God. So his point 
in this 10th commandment is very clear. We need this 10th commandment. We've been looking at the commands of God, the first nine. You can break them into two parts. The first four are focused Godward mainly for love of God. And the next, from five to nine, focus on love of neighbor. And then we wonder, how is he going to conclude these great commands? He begins by dealing with our hearts. You shall not covet. His point is this, since God is the all-sufficient one who satisfies our desires, then we must have our holy satisfaction in him alone. You see, this command exposes the sin of how we're trying to fill our hearts with all these other lesser things. Our drooping hearts and desires, we think that those things will satisfy. So the question is, how do we pursue satisfaction in God? Three ways we're going to look at from Exodus 20, verse 17. The first is this, the aim of satisfaction in God. The aim of satisfaction in God. Which leads to our sinful struggle with this command to find satisfaction in God. And finally, we'll look at the way to have satisfaction in God. Let's look here at the aim, both externally and then internally. You notice here the Tenth Commandment is external in the sense that it's talking about our neighbor. He says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Now, in Deuteronomy 5, you'll notice that it begins that list with your neighbor's wife. But here in Exodus, it's showing that the house doesn't just mean the external four walls that they live in, but it's actually the whole household. You notice here in Exodus 20 that he repeats that command, that prohibition, you shall not covet twice for emphasis and driving home the whole sense of the household of your neighbor. And the second shows the list of the people, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's servants, your neighbor's animals, ox or donkey, your neighbor's, well, anything that is your neighbor's. So this command is no small sin. It's a comprehensive command. Just like the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, is a comprehensive command. Here we end and conclude the commandments with something that is very comprehensive. Because it's not only aimed externally at our neighbor, but it's actually aimed at the heart. It pierces our hearts. Look at what the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 81, says. What is forbidden in the Tenth Commandment? Answer, the Tenth Commandment forbiddeth all discontentment with our own estate, envying or grieving at the good of our neighbor and all inordinate motions and affections to anything that is his. And you might be saying, well, Brian, I thought we dealt with contentment a few weeks ago. Well, I'm here to tell you that today this commandment even goes deeper than that of the eight as it drives home to our hearts this idea of covetousness. What is it to covet? Yes, it is a discontentment with our own estate, and it is envying and grieving over what our neighbor has. The word covet can simply mean desire or longing that is inordinate. John Courage says it refers to the inordinate, ungoverned, selfish desires for something. Something that we don't have, that we want. The Greek word here, it can actually has two Greek words. One is that for greediness, a, a desire, a strong desire, an over-desire for more, more possessions. Or, secondly, love of money or love of this world and all the pleasures of this world. We look at this in the context of Exodus 
20, we know the people of God have been delivered from Egypt and are in the wilderness. Their temptation is to grumble and complain. And where did that grumbling and complaining come from? But they were looking back at Egypt and saying, oh, look at what we had food-wise. And we, we actually had shelter and all of these things. And you brought us out into the wilderness, Moses. You brought us out here, O Lord. And they grumble and they complain, stemming from a covetous heart. So the Lord gives them this tenth command to pierce their hearts with the truth of who he is. I've delivered you out from the land of Egypt to set you free to worship me, to be with me, to be led by me. You see that? By way of illustration, I just want to talk to the children for just a second. That what, what, what do we do when we long for something more than what we have? Well, think about those warm chocolate chip cookies that your mom makes, and, and you, you only get one. But you want more because they just taste so good. They smell so delightful. You just want one more. But one more leads to, I want two more. Right? And maybe it's not just that you want more, but it's that your brother or sister got one extra one and you didn't. Now I want not what I have, but also what they have. And so you have conflict. You have sin welling up in our hearts. And we know this. Whether it's cookies or whether it is boats and houses and you name it. Money the things of this world, we long for what we don't have. That is the sinful heart of man apart from God. But this, this command is driving us in a positive direction to see who God is, to see his holy character, to see his wonders of creation, that he would create us for himself, for his own glory. And then he would come to continually sustain his people. To provide for our every need. You think about the way that he provided for Israel's every need in the wilderness. And yet, they were not satisfied. God wants us to be satisfied in him and in him alone. Our Westminster Shorter Catechism question one shows this. We are, uh, we, our chief end is to glorify God and to what? Enjoy him forever. And John Piper drives this point together. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. But you and I both know that this is not always the case. There is a conflict within our own hearts to keep this command. Why? Because of our inordinate desires, our struggle with sin. And we see the pattern of sin and the purpose of the law to expose that sin. First, the pattern of sin that we see throughout the scriptures begins in the garden with Eve and Adam. And how God had given them the command to, you can eat of all the trees of the garden except this one. The knowledge of the tree Good and evil. And Genesis 3, 6 shows us Eve's pattern of sin. She saw it. It was delightful to the eyes and she desired it. And then she took and gave to Adam and they ate from the tree. And sin came into the world and death through sin. And that pattern of sin has continued throughout history. Throughout biblical history and our history, it's our pattern of sin. It's the pattern of sin that Cain repeated as he desired the blessing of God when it was given to Abel because he offered a better offering. It was the pattern of sin for Achan in Joshua 7 when he coveted the things that were devoted to the Lord. Notice there in Joshua 7, when Joshua comes, because of the judgment on the covenant community, because of Achan's sin, he confesses this sin 
to Joshua and says, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, and 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them, and I took them. It's the pattern of sin. It's the pattern of sin we saw in David's life as from covetousness of of his neighbor's wife leads to adultery and murder. We see the pattern of sin in the pages of God's word. But do we see the pattern of sin in our own hearts? This is the purpose of the law. It's not only to show us the character of God. It starts and begins there. It is holy and righteous and good. Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 10 tells us that. In Romans uh, chapter 7. But it also exposes our sinful hearts. This is what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount. We've mentioned it several times from Matthew chapter 5 as he dealt with the 6th and the 7th commandment very explicitly there. But he's really taking the law and just applying it to the hearts of the people and ultimately taking the 10th commandment commandment, and applying it to those laws in our hearts. Look at Luke's gospel or Mark's or Matthew's gospel as it records the rich young ruler. When the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus does the simple task of taking the second table of the law and applying it to the rich young ruler's heart. And what is the response of this rich young man? I've kept all of them from my youth. That's that's old hat, Jesus. But Jesus then takes the big commandment, the tenth commandment, the, the, the commandment that pierces the heart of this rich young ruler. What does he tell him? One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. You see how he takes the 10th commandment. You shall not covet and says, what you are lacking is that you love your things, your riches, the things of this world more than me. And when you've broken that command, you've broken them. That's what Paul began to understand as he cites this commandment twice in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 7, he thought he was a righteous, upstanding, law-abiding follower of God. But when the law came, he said, it aroused sin in me. Look at what he says in verse 7 and 8. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead or dormant, right? But you bring the law, you shall not covet. It arouses all kinds of covetousness. And then in Romans 13, he shows how this commandment is a part of the second table of the law, to love your neighbor. This is actually caring for and loving your neighbor. He says in Romans 13, verse 8 through 10, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So it exposes our sin and shows us positively how we are to love our neighbor. This is a comprehensive command. 
And Paul goes on in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 to say, if you have broken this commandment, you're an idolater. In the list of all the other sins, he lists covetousness. And he says, when you commit the sin of covetousness, you are rejecting God and his good authority, his good providence in your life. And in unbelief, you are saying, I will have it my way, God. I will do it my way. That's the heart of rebellion against God. That's why Thomas Watson says, this 10th commandment is the mother sin, you see. You break this one, you've broken them all. In this series on the Ten Commandments, you might say, well, we've gotten past the first nine. Maybe I can scoot around the tenth one. Maybe it's one of those respectable sins that Jerry Bridges talks about. No, the covetousness pierces our hearts. And it shows us our fallen nature apart from God. Our heart that is desperately wicked and wants our way rather than God's. And so we need to know the way for satisfaction in God. First, it begins with Christ's work. Knowing our desperate need for a Savior in Jesus and in Him alone. The only way we can have satisfaction in the triune God is through Christ, you see. In His perfect life. From eternity past, as he commits to fulfill the covenant with his father. John 17, in his high priestly prayer, Jesus shows us a glimpse of why he came in the first place. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. You see in that prayer. Jesus showing his submission to the father's will. In his whole life. And satisfaction in his father. And to fulfill all righteousness on our behalf. Even in his humiliation. Philippians 2 shows us. As Paul says. Have this mind among yourselves. Which is yours in Christ who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, but becoming obedient, even to the point of death, even death on the cross. It's through Jesus, he is the way, to have a new life, a new record of righteousness in our place given to us. But it still, we have some problem. We have the problem of the heart, you see. A dead man can hear the preaching of the word, but the desires are not changed unless we have a new heart. That's what Ezekiel 36 had prophesied, that the Lord would give them a new heart and a new spirit to put away their idolatry and walk in his way. There's no way we can live in satisfaction in God without the new heart. That's why Jesus would say to Nicodemus in John 3, you must be born again. Brian, you say, well, that's wonderful. I see my need for a savior and his complete satisfaction on my behalf of the law, but I still have to walk this out. I still have to live this out every single day. This is called walking or living by faith in the grace that God provides for us. The people of God were to look back to the preface of the Ten Commandments and look at the name of the Lord that he gives them. I am that I am. Exodus 3.14. I am the Lord your God. I am the all-sufficient, self-sustaining one who satisfies your heart. I'm the one who has redeemed you. I'm the one who's leading you. I'm the one who's providing for your every need. Will you believe me by faith? 
They had a pillar of cloud by day. They had a pillar of fire by night. He says, believe me. Trust me. Walk in my ways. Live by faith in my promises. Live by faith in who I am. And what is this faith? It's knowing God. It's assenting to the truth of who God is. And it's trusting him with all of our hearts. That's why Hebrews says in Hebrews 11.6, Without faith, it's impossible, impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him, who earnestly, eagerly, daily seek him. I'll close with an example from Psalm 73 of Asaph as he struggles with this, this internal conflict with his own heart as he looks out at the culture around him, particularly the wicked. And he says, I know you're good, God. Truly, God is good to Israel. But when I look out at the circumstances, it seems like the wicked prosper. That they have it all together. They have all the the blessings and they are going the opposite direction. Is it worth it to walk in obedience by faith in Christ? The, the, The psalm turns on... Verses 16 and 17. As Asaph comes into the sanctuary. And he's with the people of God in worship. And he sees the end for the wicked. And he sees the judgment. The wrath of God upon the wicked. And then he's turned to profess. In verse 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Is he your portion? Is he the satisfaction of your soul? What do you most want? What do you most need? First John says, don't love the world or anything in the world. This world is passing away. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, every bit of your heart. That's the aim of satisfaction in God from this passage. And it shows the struggle with our own sinful hearts and the way of satisfaction in him through Christ. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says it this way. The Christian says creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. If I, had fi- if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly desires were never meant to satisfy it, but only arouse it to suggest the real thing. And what this 10th commandment is drawing us in to see is that God is the only one who can satisfy the longings of the human heart. He is the real thing. Let us earnestly, eagerly seek after him as our satisfaction and joy. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you do not leave us to ourselves, but you give us your law. To show us who you are and our great need for you. So, Lord, we come confessing. We acknowledge that our thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are our ways your ways. You spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Your law pierces our heart. Lord, have mercy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Your law pierces our heart and drives us to Christ. Lord, have mercy. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. Your law pierces our heart and drives us to Christ. Lord, have mercy upon us, for we are foolish, poor, and rebellious sinners in need of your grace, your favor, and your love. Let's take this time to silently pray our confession before the Lord. says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Beloved, this is the promise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, let us love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our joyful thing 
always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, triune God, and we join our voices with the angels, the archangels, and the whole company of heaven in this hymn of eternal praise. Often as we break the command that comes even to our desires, um, it's astonishing that Jesus is the one who never once coveted, who was always content. And what did it mean for Jesus to be content? Um, there is a preacher in the 1700s in Wales, so just outside of England, and um, he described the way that what it cost Jesus to be content. And he preached in a sermon a, a conversation between Jesus and Justice. And he said, Justice said, no, listen, if you come to your own, you will have to come in an animal's home with a manger for a, cr a crib and swaddling clothes to wear. And the Savior answered, I am content with that treatment for my people's sake. Well, if you face a world that's under a curse, you'll have nowhere to lay your head. You'll be homeless. You will be a target for the worst anger and malice of men every moment of your life. And he has Jesus respond, oh, my pure law, I am content with that. You will also sweat drops of blood on a cold night, and they will spit in your face and crown you with thorns, and your disciples... After they've seen all of your miracles and they've heard your doctrine, they will leave you in your worst hour. And Jesus says, though this is hard, I will not turn back. No change of heart will be mine. And then justice finishes, O oh, thou object of the praises of all angels in heaven, you're the delight of your father. If you do this as the surety, all the powers of hell will attack you. And the unmitigated wrath of your father will fall upon you. No one can think without amazement and wonder that in the face of all these storms, our surety said in the face of all, content. I am satisfied. If that's the cost of loving my sinful people, I will do it. And in that contentment, Jesus gives us himself. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. How can you be content this week? Jesus gives you himself, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So come to this table and find everything you need. If you're not a Christian, don't come and take the bread and the wine. This is a profession of faith and turning away from our discontent and coming to Jesus. So don't come to the table, but instead Jesus openly invites everyone who is dissatisfied and says, come to me and find rest. Well, let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would bless this bread and this wine, and we pray that this morning you would give us more of Jesus. 
Lord, we bring our dissatisfied, our grumbling, our discontented hearts, and we ask that you would fill us with all joy and peace in Jesus. Lord, meet with us by the Spirit, we ask in his name. Amen. We have three tables. There's one on each side, one in the middle. And there is gluten-free bread on a white plate. And there is wine is in the center, grape juice is on the outer ring. And Pastor Brian will be in the foyer for anyone who would like prayer. Come to the table and be satisfied in him.
Father, we thank you that even when we come uh, not boasting in anything that we have, we have no gifts or power or strength or wisdom to offer you that you don't already have. All things are yours, and you are the only being in existence who you are all sufficient in yourself. There is no need. You've never done anything because of a lack within the triune God. But even when you created all things out of nothing, you did it out of the overflow of your goodness and your glory. Um, and Father, we ask that you would help us to join you in the complete happiness and wholeness that is within you. Lord, you have said, truly God is good to Israel to such as are pure in heart. But Lord, we have often doubted this, and we have looked at a world that despises you, and we see a life of ease and plenty and wealth and happiness. And Lord, we are often tempted with the psalmist to say, that we are envious of the boastful and the prosperity of the wicked. Um, but Lord, we pray that you would write on our hearts this prayer, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing that I desire on earth besides you. God, please plant that within our souls and our lives this week. Even when our flesh and our hearts fail, you are the strength of our heart and our portion forever. And so, Lord, we ask that you would teach us to say, the nearness of God is my good. And, Lord, we pray that we would desire you above all else. Lord, please do that work in our hearts. And we also pray, Lord, for those who grieve. Lord, we pray for Stephanie as she grieves the loss of her stepfather. And, Lord, we pray that you would draw near to her and give her the fullness of Jesus, even in the midst of grief. And Lord, we thank you that her stepfather no longer lives by sight, but he gets to see Jesus face to face this Lord's Day. And Lord, we pray for those who care for loved ones. We pray that you give them strength and energy to serve just like Jesus has served us. Um, and help them, Lord, in the long haul to day by day lay down their own rights and their own pleasures and serve others. And Father, we pray for those who are sick. We think of Perry and Jamie and Jacqueline, of Greg and Tom and Tricia. And God, we ask that you would give them grace, um, whether it's a diagnosis or weakness or pain or fear. We pray that the, the strength and the satisfaction of Jesus would be theirs even in pain, even in sickness. Lord, please be their fullness, we ask. And please heal them. We pray for Pastor George and Karen as they're away with the FCS students. We pray you would refresh them as they see the riches of your glory um, in England. And we pray that you would bring them back safely to us. And Lord, we pray you be with Andrew Keithley as he is in Ukraine and filming. Lord, please establish the work of his hands and use it for your glory. And Father, we bless you for covenant children in this church. And Father, we ask that you would pour out the riches of your grace so that they can say, not only this is my parents' God, this is my parents' Christ, but that they will be able to say, this is my God and my Savior. Lord, we pray that the children in this church will be the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. And Lord, we thank you that as we pray all these things, even our prayers are covered by the blood of Jesus. And so, Lord, in confidence we come praying as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing.
2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. as you grabbed it this morning. Make sure you read through that. It's really helpful in knowing what's going on. Um, for one thing as well, there's a bulletin board with announcements on their way out. Just a reminder, check that bulletin board periodically. Um, it has helpful announcements. Also coming up, we have a Good Friday service on April 7th at 6.30 p.m. So mark your calendars for that. It's always a great service. Um, and the last thing is there are a lot of nursery workers we still need. So we take vows during a baptism to help one another in raising our children in the Lord. And one great way to do that is nursery. So please volunteer and sign up for that. We'll go forth in the grace of, of Jesus. <laughs> 